Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our final in this series of Listen to Him for Lent. We are in the middle of smack dab in the middle of Holy Week this week. I hope that you are having a time of reflection. I was just noting that this morning, everything has been a lot quieter this year for Lent, and maybe that's a good thing. I've had time to reflect with you in this group. I've had time to reflect more with the staff. And instead of just jumping from sermon to sermon, event to event, and meeting to meeting, I've just had some time to listen um, in preparation, which has been a good thing. So I hope that if you are a member of this church and you have had the devotion guide, I hope that you have been reading it and uh, going through it. And uh, we're going to take a break. I will post on Facebook when we are ready to start again. It'll be at least two weeks. I don't know if it'll be more than that or not, but I just haven't decided, haven't gotten that far because it's the middle of Holy Week. And uh, I probably won't reach a conclusion until after we all in this room discuss what we're going to do. And I will let you know. So without further ado, we'll let J.D. share with us the last segment of Listen to Him. along the road, if you will. And um, I want to wrap up today with the third and final Jesus prayer, the one we've been praying every single day of this journey. This is this journey, this process of going from one degree of glory to the next. You remember, we, we've been on this journey, we're trying to Staying in this massive pattern of the mind of Christ, which is all the way down and all the way up. That's the humble form. But that's the view of God's mercy. That's the pattern, not of the world, but of the mind of Christ. And you remember where we begin the Transfiguration Mountain. And we're going to end on a hill called Golgotha, Calvary, the cross. And that is the season of death. And then we will head to be lifted out of the tomb, raised. This is the road to resurrection. And this will be a grand celebration of Easter. Forty days later, Jesus will ascend into heaven. Ten days after that, we will celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. 50 days after Easter. And the amazing thing, as you continue to read through Scripture, the Acts of the Apostles, all the letters, you see this very same pattern in action. Descent, ascent. So this journey is leading us on a pathway of forgiveness, Freedom, to fullness, and these prayers that we've been praying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a, a sinner, that leads us to forgiveness. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a son or a daughter. That leads 
leads us to freedom. And the final prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. I'll just write the last word here. Uh, a saint. Now, a saint, it's a, we got to get a, 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 a better grasp on what that word actually means. Um, in, in its simplest form, it means a holy one. You see, Jesus is the original saint. He is a holy one. And to follow Jesus, to behold Jesus, is to become like Jesus. So it requires mercy as sinners to be forgiven. It requires more mercy to live the life of the freedom of a son or a daughter. And it requires even more mercy to live the life of a saint or a holy one. One who is filled with all the fullness of God. There's a tremendous prayer that we see in the third chapter of Ephesians where Paul is praying. He says, um, and I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that is set, rooted and established in love that you would be able to grasp with all God's people how high and how wide and how deep and how long is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You see, that's the Christian life, being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And the pathway to being filled is the pathway to being empty. It's this notion of just like Jesus, he emptied himself so that we could become full. But we follow him on that way of the cross, and these prayers lead us. They lead our steps. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Say it with me, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a son, a daughter. And finally, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a saint. That's bold. That's powerful. And that's 36, 36 words, 36 steps. And so I thought I've got to get to 40. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there are four. And we'll, have, we'll throw in an amen for good measure. So as we, um, as we head into Holy Week, the good the, the Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and, and then Easter morning, this is our journey. It's a journey of mercy every step of the way. It's a journey of sinner to son and daughter to saint. It's a journey from forgiveness to freedom to fullness. This is the gospel and we're listening to him. It's been a privilege to be with you on these weeks and uh, stay with us in the daily text, and we'll keep right on going.
Oh, sir. I'm going to snitch you this because I'm going to want it later. In uh, this week's video session, JD recapped the Lenten journey as a journey from forgiveness to free from a journey from here we go forgiveness, freedom, and fullness. What stories about Jesus and words from Jesus have demonstrated these movements of mercy through Luke's gospel? What have you read? Here's the question, if anything. In the devotional books over the last almost 40 days that has talked to you about forgiveness and freedom and fullness. Anything? I like the one today. <clears throat> it was um, about um, putting on the armor of God. I mean, the whole thing was about the armor of God. Did you want to say more? How, does that, how do you suppose that relates to forgiveness or freedom or fullness or all no. of the above? Or? Actually, it's... Um, you have protection, I guess, and you have more freedom. All right. All right. There we go. Any any of the other readings that spoke to anybody? All right. Do you see how you are self-willed and driven propensity towards striving for ascent, going up instead of going down? fills us with more of ourselves, while the god will path of descent leads us to an emptying of all that is false about ourselves, preparing us to become filled with all the fullness of God. Let me just, let me just say, one of my disappointments is that he keeps coming back to Philippians, which must be his thing. Um, I was telling Sue this week that J.D. always seems to want to talk about um, Jesus emptying himself. Um, not in that passage where it talks about, well, we call it the kenosis passage where uh, it talks about Jesus emptying himself and not counting being um, equality with God, something to be grasped. And he always, always comes back. And I, my suspicion is that for him, that's kind of the model understanding for him and discipleship. It's a little rough when you're supposed to be in Luke, though. And he always wants to drag us back to one of the epistles from Paul. Um, so it's a little a little hard. Um, <clears throat> but I think what I've tried to do with this study is at least demonstrate <clears throat> that the downward shift that Luke talks about from between chapters 9 and 24, and I talked about that a little last week when we, got, when we get to the reading for tomorrow. Uh, Luke's version of the Last Supper there will be a sermon tomorrow, and I will upload it, or it will, it will be uploaded, on Facebook at 5 o'clock when our, uh, I call it Listen at the Table. I didn't know what to call it before, but the thing where you, you know, where you will drive through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday in the parking lot and receive communion if you so desire. Um, but you can also pop that up on your phone and listen to it while you go through. It's longer than your trip to the driveway, will, to the drive through will be, but... Um, <clears throat> Luke takes you from where the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the members of Roman society are and takes you all the way down and says you have to be like a what? Blaine? Is your answer? So I'll come back to you every week and see if you remember. It's the same answer every week. Oh, that's a foul. Um, as we move from 9 to 24... Jesus talks about moving away from the life of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Roman officials and moving down to becoming like a child. child. Like a child. That is, that is Luke's, Luke's thing. And um, <clears throat> see, yeah, and we don't all, we don't all think about um, the Monday Thursday story. We all think about it from John, right? That was, that was my great sermon I had planned until I said, oh, we're in Luke. I can't talk about Jesus taking the towel off and wrapping it around. That's, that's a different gospel. 
And it's not <clears throat> that Luke doesn't think that that didn't happen. It's that Luke is telling the story to make a specific point. And the point, I think, where he takes off the towel, wraps it around his waist, and washes his feet, <clears throat> Luke chooses to do that with the teaching moment at the table and around the table on Thursday and says, you know, the wealthy folks lord over other people. You're not to be that way. And see, the other thing that comes with wealth in ancient societies is, no, do I have any YouTubers here? No YouTubers, right? So if I talked about a Patreon page, you would have no idea what I'm talking about. But if I talked about um, a patron, of the arts, would you know what I'm talking about then? Somebody who says, I think that the arts are important, and I don't know when that started, whether it was the Middle Ages or whenever, or maybe, maybe it started in Roman culture, probably. But there would be wealthy people who felt it was their obligation, because of their wealth, to give away the, the wealth and support um, benevolent causes. And as the wealthy people gave away their money, to support benevolent causes, it would then become your job and the job of the recipients of that to give them honor and glory and praise and all that stuff because, um, because they gave all the money. So one of the things that happens around the, around the, the Passover table on Thursday is that Jesus says in Luke, no, 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 you don't, you don't give stuff away and expect something back. You don't give something away and you don't expect your name on a plaque. And I'm starting to probably hit close to home. Because I had a church in rural retreat and my wife was there one Sunday. And there was a family who no longer resided in southwest Virginia. And every year they would go on vacation or wherever they were traveling. And they would travel through southwest Virginia and they would stop at the church to make sure... The picture of Jesus. That the picture of Jesus with their parents' name on it that they had donated was still hanging in the church. I'm not sure what they were going to do if that picture wasn't there. Well, we were building a fellowship hall. So, you know, the first thing we did was take all the pictures off the wall. Because if you've been through a construction project, well, maybe not here. But ours was, like, connected. And I'd been through two of them. I'd been through one already. And when you break out the jackhammer and the buildings are connected... Everything kind of bounces around, and the pictures, even if they're on the walls, will come off the wall. So, better take them off. And they showed up, and the picture wasn't on the wall. Who doggies. Oh, my goodness. So, fortunately, my wife was here to say, wait, I know where that picture is. <clears throat> and it isn't, you find out that um, if you get your reward here, you don't get it in heaven. The point is, you're not supposed to be after a reward. You just give it, and you give it away. And you give it away to the worthy and the unworthy. And that's kind of the point of, of the talk around the table. Now, I don't know if Luke or Jesus or anybody, um, I don't know if they had kids. Um, but see, kids give stuff away and don't ever expect anything back, right? Parents in the room, you remember your first bouquet of dandelions? You remember your first bouquet of dandelions? Did, did y'all get your first bouquet of dandelions? Okay. Or they'll make you the ugliest thing you ever saw in school and bring it home, and it's for you, baby. I got a whole drawer full of that stuff that my wife is keeping. Okay. The kids just give stuff away, and it's really valuable to them, and they don't, they don't care. They don't care. You just need to have it. So mm -hmm. one of the things, <clears throat> so I appreciate, you know, JD, but I think if he stayed with Luke, and if he wanted to trace that Jesus is trying to get the disciples to understand that instead of emptying yourself, which is you know Paul's concept, you can talk about being like a child, which is Luke's concept. It's the same thing essentially, but if you're going to be in Luke, you probably need to stay with stay with Luke's language. Otherwise, you probably should be explaining why you sound like Paul when you're trying to work with Luke. So you probably don't care, but I do. So it's, I feel I feel bad for that. Are there things that make you uh, stall out in shifting from 
ascent to descent are the things that get in your way. That you find yourself wanting to climb rather than descend. Life is good. We all have it so good. Why change? That's right. No pressure, no... So, and we tend to change when what? When we hit the, hit the skids and are on the rocks. And if things are good, there is no motivation whatsoever to change. Anything else get in your way? Well, it's pretty countercultural. So, it can be hard to buck that. Well, and we live in a culture right now where, uh, oh, what do they call it? Virtue, virtue signaling is what is the current word that we're using. I would call it posturing. I, if you're really old, you could call it bragging. Um, but there are things that you do that communicate how amazingly righteous you are and how unrighteous every, I mean, the entire, you know, um, social media is just, just filled with people. Corporations do this all the time. Um, do you think do you think that they care about any of the stuff that they give money to? Corporations, I believe, are amoral. <clears throat> the corporation's purpose is to make money. So if they can fool you into thinking that they care, the members of a corporation, people who go to work every day, can care. The tax write up. It is. Now my sister in law who works for an unnamed company would disagree with me immensely right now, because she she firmly believes that Corporations should be good, good citizens, you know. Um, but I would suggest to you that a corporation. Right now, we're in the process of talking about structural racism. Well, <clears throat> corporations have structural biases built in, and your bias for any any organization is its own survival. They will fight for its own survival first, and it will condition its members in a thousand subtle ways to fight for its survival. And for a corporation, that means that your profits have to go up. Um, you just take a look at what Amazon has been doing to its employees, all in the name of profit. We don't go there. I just, that upsets me greatly. Um, <clears throat> so, I think for me, uh, um, anybody else have anything they wanted to share before I go in? Um, I think it's um, the need for self-esteem and the need to be patted on the back and said you did a good job. Because last week when we talked about getting in, talked about getting in the shower, was that last week or the week before? We talked about getting in the shower before anything starts. Just saying. Last week. Last week. Um, Oh, whatever the prayer is here. Um, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have, have mercy, mercy on me. me. That sinner. wasn't the thing anyway. Oh, it, it was, um, this is my beloved son or daughter oh. in whom I am well pleased. That's where we were last week. And to know that God loves you unconditionally before you've done anything during the day is at odds with who I am, especially a guy. Because guys are geared in our society our value and worth comes from what we do, right? What we do plus what people think of us equals what we are. So, anyway, I decided to throw that one out. Um, how has your understanding of discipleship been challenged over the past six weeks? Any challenges over the last six weeks? Anything changed about discipleship? I've never gone around the room. <laughs> don't don't start. Now. Don't start now. I know. Because I know. this is when I'm really interested. I'm really interested if, if something has changed over the last six weeks for you. I'm, I'm, I'd be interested to know what it is. But on the other hand, I also am aware that it may be a little on the personal side. So you're going to say something before I threaten to go around the room. Or you're just thinking, okay. Not really. I'm thinking that all the changes that are going on in the country while we are in this, you know, we're in this study, and it, it can't help but overlap a little bit. Mm -hmm. Things that happen here that were happening all around. And, and I'm 
thinking of you know forgiveness and freedom. Freedom? That means different things to different people. Different people, yeah. Well, and that's one of one of the things I think we have to be really careful of in Christianity is that when the New Testament talks about freedom, we have to use its definition of what freedom is. It's not the 21st century American patriot. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not that. Um, and it was interesting. There was a um, shift. I'm not, oh gosh, it's John Brown. I don't know if y'all know who John Brown is. Um, he was a preacher who was a slave in the 1800s. And um, was encouraged greatly by, and, and he, they, he would be moved around and he would be allowed to preach here, there, wherever. Um, they found his Bible, I think it was last year. Um, anyway, the preaching in the black community was originally about <clears throat> being freed by um, by being good good servants. Okay, that just slaves should serve their master, all that stuff. Well, the interesting thing is that John Brown, he has kind of a watershed moment and his preaching moves <clears throat> from, from that to the exodus and to the freeing of God's people and being free to serve God. <clears throat> and at that juncture, what you have is you have two very, very different concepts of, of freedom and that's the point at which he will lose, he will lose his life. Um, but <clears throat> he begins to suspect that maybe the current version of freedom <laughs> is not a biblical concept of freedom. And I would suggest to you that when we talk about those sorts of things, <clears throat> when we talk about freedom, I just want to share with you, <clears throat> since the Gallup poll just said that we became an official minority, Christianity became a minority so at some point in the last year in this country, our view of what freedom is is going to be very different. Uh, our, our view of what freedom is going to be is, is just is just very very different than than what is being traded out there. We do not view freedom as an exchange of power. It isn't that you've got power and I want it, or you have taken power and you have held me down. That's not our version of freedom. That's not what it's about. How does a Christian become free? Sin is still the Bible, at least the New Testament. All right, well, let me, let me just say, okay, uh, let me see if I can get to this. You are free from sin, but see, that's that's the other thing. American religious traditions and the holiness movement, always we always talk about what we're free from. From yourself. That's true. And, that, and what I'm after is, what are we free to? What are we free to, to be or to do? Huh? Wow. Which means our power, okay, since we're talking about power transactions out there right now, and who's got it and who doesn't, and who's oppressing who, and who's a victim, and who's not a victim, <clears throat> what Christians believe is that we take the power, and where does it go? It goes to Jesus. And the only way we're free is if we give up our power, all of it. The only way we get to be free, Blaine, your question, the answer is? Childlike. Childlike. The only way you gain power and freedom in this world is to become like a child. It is to take off the towel tomorrow night, right? Put it around your waist and wash everybody's feet. Okay, my friends, nobody's talking about that now. Nobody. And I don't hear the church talking about it. I just got an email this week. And I was sorely disappointed. We sounded so much like the world, it wasn't even funny. Um, no, nobody's talking about that. You won't ever be free. You won't ever be free if you're trying to take something that somebody else has got. And there's nothing harder in this world, I don't think, than giving everything to Jesus. I mean, we call him what? Jesus is our... This is a good American phrase. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. 
Wait a minute, what I ask tonight. I just can't I just can't get this get what I want from you tonight. I don't know. Savior, Lord. Lord and Savior. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Okay. Hey, if Jesus is going to be your Lord, then um, you become servant, you become servant of all. And I just I don't I don't hear a lot. I don't see it. And it troubles me greatly. And this, during this whole thing, this was an opportunity where the church had a chance to stand up and say something, and we did not. We did not. What did you think that the church should be saying? Exactly that. That this isn't about power. This isn't about who has it and who doesn't have it. This is about surrendering, surrendering to Jesus. I'm going to help you not because you're a victim and you're oppressed. I'm going to help you because I love you. Because God loves you and Jesus loves you. And if I love you, I'm not going to burn your house down. But you're going to sound a lot more like Martin Luther King and a lot less like Malcolm X. Okay. But it goes for politics too. Uh, who was I listening to who's, who's been, in, been in Washington for exactly two years? And somebody said, what surprised you about going to Washington? I don't remember whether he was a senator or a representative. And his answer was the hate in this town. Rick Scott. He said, he said, oh, is it Rick? That's, I heard that same thing. Yeah. He said, what surprises you? And he said, uh, there's the hate in this town. And I thought, wow. And it's hard because if I depend on somebody else to, you know, to get elected, to feed me my self-esteem, then uh, there's no win. Somebody's always going to lose. And that's going to be tragic. And what happens tomorrow night is Jesus says, what, this is my body. This is my bread. Oh, yeah, this, is, this is my body. This is my blood. Broken for you. Shed for you. I lost. So you don't have to. You gain everything. And you, you lose everything but gain. That's how that goes. You lose. I know. In losing everything, you, you wind up being able to keep everything. But until you're willing to lose it all. And, and there's a lot of people out there grasping. A lot of people out there grasping. Um, troubles me. Just just troubles me. Um, has the Jesus prayer done anything for you? Oh, wait a minute. Did I skip one? There we go. How has Jesus captured your attention over the course of the study? And how is the Holy Spirit shaping your deepest intentions differently than before? Are you in the Holy Spirit any place different than you were six, week, six weeks ago? What do you think, Pam? I, I started Lent not with giving something up this year, but uh, other than perhaps my time, because I, I'm, my goal was to, to get to know Jesus better. And so I've been reading the red letter New Testament. Part of this. I had to go back to my mother's Bible to find one with red letters. And uh, and I sit there and read it, and I ask the Lord to, to speak to me. Our Holy Spirit highlights what I need to, to hear. Um, and I sit there, read that, and I cry. I mean, I, I mean, just, I don't know, cry tears. So, so I think, I mean, it, it's, it's made a difference for me. I've heard that <clears throat> someone told me this a long time ago uh, the ancients said that was uh, putting you in tears or you cry. Receiving the Holy Spirit. I feel like that, yeah. Well, some people do. Christi Christianity, will, the, the saints will talk about that in different places. That some people, some people shout hallelujah, I, not, I cry. And that's what I do. And I thought that was weird. And I discovered it is not weird. Men don't do it in public. So, but, it, you know, I, I, I think you're 
Yeah, absolutely. Right. There's another sense. thing. When I was growing up, like I've, I've been in church all my life, but I, what I heard about from Jesus was, I mean, us two things. You know, you hear Jesus loves you, he's good, blah, 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 and all this. But I also heard a lot of his condemnation constantly, you know. And I was getting a really rough picture of, of how he felt about us, you know. And um, and I knew it was wrong, but I so said that was one, one reason I wanted to go back and read just exactly what he said and speak to me. Look. Let me see the love coming through those words. Well, it's amazing how much how much of it is it about is it is about following him. Um, and not following he has its consequences, right? I think we all agree not following him has consequences. But <clears throat> don't spend a lot of time talking about that. Don't have more consequences. That's what the Bible says. Yes. <clears throat> but if you talk about judgment without mercy without salvation then you're everything that people outside the church say we are <clears throat> but if with judgment comes a way out then, then that's ultimately <clears throat> fair I think and we get little glimpses somewhere today I read so glad to see it when it said this is the generation this is the generation that, and I can't even remember the rest of it um, that, um, that I have sent you or something like that but uh, all the bad things you know that are happening in our country and, and <clears throat> so many things we'd like to change but this is the generation that we have been placed in I bet you were reading Jeremiah. I bet you. Actually, I, I read a lot of Jeremiah. Okay. Because that would that's Jeremiah's, I mean, that is Jeremiah's stories, and there are places where almost those exact words come out a couple of times. Are we talking about David Jeremiah? Or no, the prophet, prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Okay. Well, because what, you know, God is going to say, well, I'm, I'm sending you, and he says, well, I'm, you know, it's a wicked generation, and I'm too young and all this stuff, and, and God's comment is, this is a gen, you know. This is this is your this generation, is and this, this is the time. And I am sending you, and I understand. I understand, and I'm not sending you with a real popular message, there, guy. The message you're taking is, it's over. It's over, and you're going to exile. There's the popular message. Everybody was on the phone to the DS the next day, saying, "Get this this guy out of here. He's all gloom and doom. We don't want him." Uh, but that's you know. It was very hopeful. I, um, yes. Just a small little thing, and I said, "Yeah." But yeah, and, and yeah, he goes, and he does, and um, and he finds the courage and the hope to do it. Um, so things are not. It's not 1986 anymore. I've come to that conclusion. I wish it were. I wish it were 1982. Jeff Lynn and I. We all don't know who Jeff Lynn is here, do you? Jeff Lynn is a half of ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra. He was big when I was in school, and he has a song about him wishing it were 1982 again. So we must be roughly, roughly the same age. So he's aged better than I have, but he's got more important people to look after than I do, so I don't have anybody to look after in that case. Take the knocks and keep on going, baby. So um, how has Jesus captured your attention over the course of the study? Oh, uh, have you, how have the three Jesus prayers encouraged you or challenged you? And which one has been the most difficult for you? Or you don't like the Jesus prayer, that's fair. Mm -hmm. The last statement. I don't think any of us deserve to be called saints. I can't argue with the God. <laughs> Still okay. <laughs> that's what we want to know. That, that's that's what you want. That's right. The first one, mm -hmm. the center. Yeah, that one flows. Yeah, right in there. <laughs> After that. Well, it's um, because you guys are dads. So let me ask you this question: Do you read the second? I, I read the second one very differently now than I would have uh, twenty years ago. My wife and I were talking about this because 
we were talking going back to the Susan Richter Bible study that we did. You know, when she talked about the Betav, the, the Father's house, which is going to make the sermon tomorrow night. Um, and is it, I think it's at the center of the Passover table on Monday, Thursday, the whole concept. But it's interesting when you think about God looking at you and calling you a son or a daughter after you have raised a child. Well, after you've raised a child, it assumes that there's a terminus to raising a child. Also discover that they're really, you're always a father. Always a mother, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just ease into it now. It just it doesn't it doesn't go away. But it but you know the bulk of the, the raising thing, and you think about all the things that you have done over the years, um, because you love your kids and that you would do for your kids and that you would lay down your life for your kids. And I, for me anyway, it's I you know in seminary I, I could have answered the question and giving you a textbook answer, but at 57, I I get it. You know what I'm saying? I've been there, done that, and you understand, you know differently now, having having been there. You have more time when you get older, when it says, delight yourself in the Lord. I have time to do that now. And <clears throat> there was a time in my life, I didn't really have much time to delight myself. I mean, just take all the time that I wanted. I have, I'm the same place. <laughs> so, yeah. so there is something to look forward to. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Well, that's good. Well, because see, my my I had I tell often tell the story about doing Bible study, and I looked at them and I all said, "I'm looking forward to the day when I get to be your age and things get easier." And they all laughed at me, and they said, "You think things get easier?" So I wish you all had been there to say, "Not easier, but there's a, a you know." A better place where there's more time to but things change with age I've discovered just because you can answer the questions on a textbook about being a parent and you can say well God's a parent and this is what the New Testament says about it and then there's <clears throat> having been a parent then you read it and you say oh I get that now um, or when the psalmist says delight in the Lord and then you're there um, it's <coughs> sometimes has such a wonderful sense of humor. And if I get busy, there are days when I'm very busy and I'm, I'm not going to have time to really uh, pour over my um, Bible study. Or, or maybe I've got a real bad problem that one of my friends or my children or somebody has. And, and he will wake me up. And it's, it's, I mean, not all the time, but with regularity. About 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And I wake, and there's no reason for me to wake. And then I kind of start laughing because I know I'm supposed to get up and do my time with him then, so I'll have plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Then you just go back to bed. Yep. Then you go back to sleep? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes I do not. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Cause... Oh, I, they can, can, can. Plan. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's kind of stuck with me. We're pretty good at reading the Bible, some of us at least, and praying. But if you spend, if, and you said more if you could, but uh, 10 minutes of reading the Bible and 10 minutes of praying, and then 10 minutes of listening, uh, a few of us, myself included, don't allow equals, uh, an equal amount of time for listening. L listening is really hard. Yeah, that's the most important. But it's really, it's really hard. And, and you will notice, um, 30 years ago, I took, I took silent prayer out of worship because it made people uncomfortable. Uncomfortable enough for people to come up and say, you, you need to take that out. That's a waste oh of time. Oh, my goodness. Well, Especially see, you me. should be up front, though. You should be up front and try and lead a congregation through, through silent prayer. And, and, and you can feel, after about a minute and a half, you can feel the absolute discomfort that just travels throughout the entire, the entire group. And it's That's like, wow. good. Well, it is, unless you want to keep your job. I mean, you want to you want them to be uncomfortable, so they'll look for something else. Well, it's just but, but the, you know the offertory, you know when the music's played. That, I love yes. that. I do too. 
And that's one of, that's one of the things I have come to see. There's lots of things I appreciate way more now than I did a year ago. And the offertory is one of those things. I, I just, I'm never going to go back to the offertory the way it was. I mean, it, it was starting to change somewhat before this for me, but this has really kind of brought it to a head that the offertory is so much more than just dropping money in a plate and listening, you know, listening to David play. It's about, it's about offering all those other things up to God and letting David help you get there. If you're at the 11 o'clock service, if not, if you're at the 8.30 service, it's whoever or whatever is singing up front um, that help, they help get you there. That's just how it goes. So. I notice when I start my devotions, I always like to start with music like on my phone. And, and I, it opens my heart and, and I said, I'm ready to be with God. But then I have to turn it off. Exactly. I cannot even have a door open. If the door is, I can, I can go upstairs, but if the door is open just a little bit and I can hear the television or hear what's going on, no. Then it, then it gets interrupted. You can't can't focus. Well, it's distracting. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's interesting. I think um, I was wondering about um, the Desert Fathers. I guess there were de Desert Mothers, too. I didn't, I never read any of their work, but, you know, when they, they went out into, you know, the, the, the desert to get away from absolutely everything. I don't think I understood that till, um the last year or so living in this country that at some point, you just you just want to get away from everything and wall yourself up in a little hut so you and God could spend some time together because it's hard to hear with all the all the chatter. And not only is it the television, but for me anyway, a lot of times it's <clears throat> you have to work really hard to shut the outside world off. I guess I guess that's one of the things that has surprised me this year is that a lot of the internal stuff is very independent of what's going on. Out here, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's about, but um, what happens internally, um, the peace and the security and all that kind of stuff is in here. It's not. It's not out here. You know, it's not because the president's doing a great job and Congress is doing an even better job. And, no, it's because looking. God is in control. And well, see, and that's yeah. Are you reminded your, Are you letting your mind do that? Yes. And I'm not saying I'm there yet, but because um, there's a, I mean, we went we went from like a five or a six to a twenty-seven on the Richter scale here, on, of, at least for me anyway, about how how disruptive the world is. And I, I wish I could close the door and shut it off, but there's there's stuff you can do. Um, I had somebody share some stuff with me just to shut it off and um, find God. So. Anyway, oh, let's see. How will Easter be different for you this time around? Easter going to be different. Y'all turned in your reservations, right? Actually, you did. Some of them you did twice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, how will Easter be different? Aside from the fact that we were all just sitting down having breakfast together, we're doing takeout. We've had a hard year. Everyone has had a hard year with this pandemic. And, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's come down to what, what do you really believe? And so many people believe so many different things. And it's, it's wonderful to have, um, to have the belief that we about um, Jesus and Easter. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this isn't true, the 11 o'clock service, but the 8.30 service is the first service I have on Sunday morning. <clears throat> and there are Sundays I walk in and I am ecstatic to be there. Because I'm not alone. And sometimes you feel like you are alone. And I think Easter is going to be different. 
because I think with the things that are being said out there and the things that are being done, and if people who don't believe the same, it is going to be really good, I think, this year to be with people who confess a risen Lord, I think. For me, anyway. And it's good to be with people. Um, and it surprised me, because it's my job. So whether whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad, to get up and to make Sunday happen. And uh, it surprised me during the pandemic that all of a sudden I got in front of people on Sunday morning. They hit me. Remember, the, I can tell you the first 830 service, I just got up and I just smiled. And I thought, my gosh, it is, it is so good. It is so good to be here this morning. Not because I have to, not because I'm getting paid to, but because it's just plain good to be here with everybody. And uh, That's really good for an introvert. It's <laughs> incredibly, thank you, because not everybody understands. Um, that's great for an introvert. So it's just to get up and you just, I, I, remember, I, I remember the Sunday distinctly. I got up and I thought, it is, it is so good to be here. Um, and it had been after, you know, Y'all hadn't been here for months. We had been doing everything online. It wasn't the first Sunday we were back live. It happened a little bit after that. I just got up there and I thought, boy, it is just good. Yeah, where else do you fit? Exactly. Where else do you well, fit? Where, 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 exactly. who, who else's table do you come to? You know what I'm saying? I just, t tomorrow night, I, it, it, uh, the readings for tomorrow night just have a very sp special place, I think, for me this year. Where else are you going to gather around the table with God's family? Where else are you going to do that? But here. And maybe we don't always get it. I, you know, you'll have to listen to the sermon, but um, my, my poor wife already has because she recorded it today. So, um, But uh, <clears throat> where else are you going to go? Some of the things on television are satanic. I, I laugh. What is that, C SPAN? <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, I'm sorry. They just, just go, go, go. I, I just, well, you know, when you hear a congressional representative turn to somebody and say, see, because somebody's, you know, I, I watch more C SPAN now because I got tired of being frightened and scared and yelled at on news networks. I thought, well, if I just go watch C SPAN, that won't happen, right? <laughs> But I'll, I'll tell you who it was. It was Jerry Nadler. And and they were debating the current bill in the House. And um, Jerry Nadler turned to some congressman and he looked at him and said, I don't care. Your God, anybody's God, has no place in this chamber or telling this Congress what to do. And I thought, oh, my God. Well, I've been praying that he'd be there, so... Got well, I, I would tell you, I just, um, well, the, and then somebody stood up and he was talking to, um, he was talking to a representative from, uh, and this I picked up from Steuben County, New York, because we were, we were from New York and the, the congressional district would have included Jamestown, which is where we, where we lived when we first moved. So, and he's a good guy. He's a good guy. But. I just, it's hard because it's just, it's its a scary place out there. And they don't, they, and I don't think during the pandemic they cared. It's been about ratings. They're and brazen. They, they absolutely, it's just brazenly done. There are a few things that happened this last week. I looked at my husband and our house just dropped open. We said, surely this is not yeah. what we are doing. Yeah, David, David Jeremiah does it. David Jeremiah does a study, and we did it a few years ago. I I I, I know I ought, I ought to break it out again because the, the title of the stars study is um, I never thought I'd see the day. I love David Jeremiah, and he talks about um, David. He, we're we're the same age. I, I discovered he and I, because um, uh, I remember him when he started out. He's a very different preacher than he was. We we both changed a lot over the years. Um, which I have to snicker at. I, I think. I think. I think for the better. I, I enjoy his depth that he comes at things with now. Um, but he talks about the things that are going on, and he he pokes because you know me and your parents. 
you know, you, I always joke, I, I sound like my parents. Well, I never thought I'd see the day that, you know, never thought I'd see. And you sound like you're, you know, you're old. And uh, it's just, it was just crazy stuff happening. Just crazy, crazy stuff. But when I come here, I don't, I don't even know that we all have to believe all the same stuff on the periphery, but at least when I come here and we worship for an hour, I know that Jesus is Lord, and I can experience the fact that Jesus is Lord uh, for an hour. And we can discuss, you see, we can... Um, well, and those are, and they're hard things. A men's prayer group will tell you how hard it is to discuss this stuff. It's really hard. Um, and it's it just, it's tough. It's, it's just very difficult. Because not everybody has the same opinion. Okay. But <clears throat> somewhere in our culture, we've, we've lost the ability to have, when we've talked about this, to have civil discourse. You know, when I was growing up, we were all taught to respect each other and to listen to each other and to debate. We had debates. Sure we did. You see, I'm, I'm not, you know, and I guess I am ancient now. This is learning how to debate in Mrs. Doherty's English class and standing up there. And we had to take positions that weren't ours. And, and because you were respectful. Yes. And, and it was on, you know, you, you fought with your words, and, but you were very respectful and good men. See, when I was growing up, the two big things were the Equal Rights Amendment and abortion, and we did both of those. And, and you know, you give it to somebody, and they say, why? I don't think women should be working. And Mrs. Doherty would just pat them. Well, she wouldn't pat them on the head, but she might just as well. And said, you know, this isn't about your position. This is about you understanding how you defend a position. And so I, and everybody can't be on the same team. So she said, your object is to learn how to debate and how to do this. And we don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, we just we cancel people. Jesus doesn't cancel people. And worry about that. That's like we never want to change people. We just want them out of our way, or out of the system. We don't want to devote any effort or time or right. anything to change them. It's like we just see if you if you get rid of them, you don't have to love them. And loving people is hard. Loving people. I was um, having this discussion about somebody coming to church. And I don't know, we'll see. I just keep I just keep chipping away at it. And one of the one of the things you talk about is you know, one of the reasons you look at church, you say, Well, they, they don't treat each other real well all the time. And it's like, well No, they don't. Fair observation. They're not perfect. What about that? They're not, but you know what? We work on it here. We work on it. Don't, don't go, because you won't. They'll kick you out. That's right. Don't mess it up. That's and, right. And then there's the, the church is not a, a museum of saints. It's a workshop for sinners. It is. Heard that it is. And, and all those all those quaint things are are true. Mm -hmm. They just they are true. So, um, and that's why I think Easter is going to be extra special this year. I think it's just for all of those reasons because I you know you're part of a community that doesn't cancel each other. And no matter how hard things are, one of the things that happened, um, there was an event I, I came to, I probably shouldn't even share what the event was when I first got here. And a group of people in the room and, and they had, had um, a major falling out at some point a long time ago. And I just sat there and they all went around the room and they said, don't you think it's about time? It was men's prayer breakfast. I know. I wasn't going to say that. You said you didn't remember. I was no, I said I wasn't you. going to say it. So. Oh, but there okay. it is. Anyway, and, and they all sat went around the table and, and forgave each other. And said, it's just, I mean, I think they all had forgiven each other, but they hadn't said so. And it was just, I, it was just, it was just a very, a very moving moment for me. I have it. Um, that happens. That happens so seldom. Um, and, and there are people in church who don't do that. And I, I get that. But you got to come together and you got to try. Um, 
because otherwise you wind up looking like a culture we're living in, a culture that just cancels people. And not canceling people and loving people is really, really hard. Really, really hard. Yeah. But you have to become like a what, Blaine? A child. I a think. child, I think. I think that would be the right answer. So um, take that home to my wife. I mean, you need to act like a child. <laughs> Sure so when I get a phone call from Rhonda, <laughs> when I, I think that's a slightly different context. Yeah, I, get, I, get, I actually get in trouble for that. Darn it. Yeah. I get a phone call from Rhonda. What is this I hear you told my husband he could act like a child? There you go. So anyway. I didn't hear that last sentence. I was sticking on the first one. Uh, so anyway. All right. Well, we're going to close and we're going to close in prayer. And then if you all give me a couple minutes and we'll decide what we're going to do next. Um, so we'll, we'll be gone for at least two weeks to my folks online, and uh, I don't know if we'll be longer than that or not, but we'll, it'll certainly be at least two weeks. So let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks this evening, and we give you thanks for your presence of, of the Holy, for the presence of the Holy Spirit in the room and, and online, and we give you thanks for the holy conversation. And being Christian is not always easy, and following Jesus is not always easy, and listening to Him. It isn't always easy, but it is always rewarding. And we give you thanks for the journey that we have been on together. We give you thanks for the journey we've been on to these 40 days as a church, as a staff, as Bible study group. And we are anticipating, anticipating Sunday when uh, we can gather and serve a risen Savior. Amen. Good night, everybody. Good night.